Here's just a representation of what the uh, lateral RNP and ANP represents. Uh, the airplane itself has an area around it that is called the ANP circle, the actual navigation performance circle. And that's where the FMC basically will look at it, it, uh, its navigational accuracy and it puts you within a 95% accuracy uh, within that circle. The RNP would be the required navigation performance for the airspace that you're in. Airplane position would be represented by the uh, little vertical hash mark. That would be where the airplane is. And then, of course, this triangle would represent uh, the FMC, uh, in this case, the lateral position of the FMC, like, for example, if you're an LNAV. And in this case, the airplane position and the LNAV position would be uh, uh, right on. And then the RNP, you can see, would be represented by these uh, single uh, vertical hash marks, and that would be in reference to whatever the RNP is from the, your airplane center line for the airspace that you're in. And that's going to change. You know, en route, it might be two. As you get into the approach area, it might be one. On departure, it will be one. And uh, But uh, as you do the approach, it may be point uh, three, for example, if you're doing an RNAV GPS. So you can see the circle around the airplane is two times the ANP, and that represents where the airplane is estimated to be 95% of the time by the FMC position. If the, uh, the actual navigation performance then would be represented by the bar here, uh, the white bar, and that would be the uh, ANP. You can see that coming down here. The actual navigation performance is this, the white bar. And of course, this space in between here is, is your um, really your maneuver space right here. The difference between the ANP and the RNP is your uh, excess, if you want to call it that, your maneuver space. As, these, if, as the accuracy becomes less, these bars would tend to move in. And if they continue to move in and they touch each other, then the ANP would equal the RNP, and, uh, and, and that would not be good because now your accuracy would be such that uh, you're not able to maintain the uh, required navigation performance. So uh, typically you're going to see them like this where you do have um, um, the ANP and depending on what the ANP is the bars will be real small or a little bit bigger but the less accurate they are the more they'd move in the more accurate they are the, the they'd move out. And again your airplane position in reference to the uh, the lateral uh, navigation, like in this case if we were an LNAV, would be displayed as the difference between the triangle and, and your vertical line, which is where you are. Here's a representation of the, uh, for example, the LNAV course. And if we end up uh, left of our route, the LNAV course would show to correct to the right, and that would be represented by the uh, magenta triangle. And again, the airplane position would be right here, and the triangle would represent the LNAV position. And in this case, you can see the airplane position is to the left of your uh, routing. We need to correct right to get back on course. If you're right on the route, or right on the lateral profile like LNAV, uh, the magenta would be lined up with the, or the airplane position, which is the single vertical line, and we would be right on course. If we end up to the right of the route, um, then the pointer will go to the left. Again, the airplane position is right here. The pointer is the difference between the airplane position and the LNAV course. And you can see in this case, we are to the right of the course, and we need to correct to the left to get back to the center line. Uh, this would represent a large FMC position uncertainty. The bars are bigger, and you can see the ANP has grown, and it's uh, you know getting closer to the RNP uh, limit. And you can see here that if we were to get to the uh, left of the route like we are here, we need to correct right to go back to uh, our course. But if we uh, drift too far left and the ANP starts to infringe on the RNP, uh, then the scale itself will turn amber because now we're outside the RNP boundary. Uh, we aren't within it with a circle. So this scale will turn amber. 
And you'll notice the bars haven't changed because the A and P hasn't changed. It's just your aircraft position has changed in reference to the R and P, and we're infringing on the R and P now, so it turns amber. If we were to get a, a large FMC position uncertainty that continues to grow, then eventually these uh, two bars would touch. If they touch, it'll go amber, and you'll get a nav unable RNP message because now the RNP equals the ANP, and you don't have the required accuracy to maintain the RNP limit. Same thing happens on the vertical profile. Uh, again, the airplane uh, rep is represented by the middle uh, white hash mark. Uh, if you happen to get above the path, the pointer will move down. And again, your position is right at the uh, horizontal line, and you notice the desired VNAV path is uh, below us, and that means we're high in the path. If we're right on the VNAV path, it's centered, and you can see here again, if we get low on the path, the needle, a uh, little uh, triangular symbol, uh, will move up, representing the path, and in this case, uh, we're the where we are is the uh, little white hash mark, and the uh, path is, in this case, above us, and so we're below the VNAV path. Uh, again, you can see the uh, we have the RNP and feet uh, for the vertical path as well. And you can see, in this case, uh, we're within the RNP in each one of these situations. Even though we get high on the path here, we haven't infringed on the RNP yet. So the scale is still white, but you can see if we go too high in the path and we start to infringe on this uh, RNP, then the scale itself will turn magenta as well. So you can see here it says the vertical uh, nav performance scale display the same relationship between the maneuver space and the ANP as the lateral navigation performance scales do. And this would show if we were to infringe uh, on that, uh, we get below the path, and now we cut into the uh, RNP with our accuracy circle, the scale turns uh, amber. And again, if the error, uh, if the ANP grows and it, uh, the two, two white lines touch, then the ANP will e equal the RNP and the whole scale will turn uh, amber, and you'll get a... Uh, Unable RNP message as well. And you can see in this case we're right on the path, and the ANP is within the RNP, and so everything is uh, really good here. That's what we want to see. Uh, the integrated approach navigation profile looks like this. It's very similar to an ILS approach, with the exception that uh, when the glide path is alive, and really we use more like we use more of this when it's about two miles from the final approach fix we'll go gear down flaps 20. we use that more than glide path alive because like we said a um, glide path is different than a glide slope a glide slope is more like a fan and it uh, fans out so the further you are from the runway the wider the fan is so the glide slope will move slow when you're further when you're pretty far out it, if you're closer in, the glide slope will move uh, faster because the uh, fan is starting to narrow. Well, the glide path, though, is more like a tube. It's your, uh, it's your RNP, uh, which is, which is going to narrow on the approach. And when that glide path is alive, it tends to move uh, faster than a glide slope would move. So we normally will configure um, earlier than we would for an ILS approach. But you'll notice that the profile looks uh, pretty much the same as an ILS approach. There's not a lot of difference. Uh, although an IAN approach is not an ILS approach, but it has the same alerting as an ILS approach, which is the advantage. The other difference is it, it is not to an auto land um, like an ILS uh, approach would be, where we have land three. And again, normally we would disconnect at some point and manually land. Uh, unless we're doing CAT 2 or 3 approaches, then it would be an auto land. But in the case of an IAN approach, um, flare and rollout are not going to arm. And you would have to disengage the autopilot, just like in any non-precision approach. You would have to disconnect the autopilot in accordance with regulatory requirements, and then disconnect the autothrottle for landing.
This is what the IAN uh, RNP would look like on the approach. Normally we're going to go from an approach or an en route type of RNP to a um, approach RNP, so it's going to narrow. And again, this is where I say this looks more like a tube than a glide slope. A glide slope would be more of a fan, the glide path is more of a tube. That happens vertically and that also happens laterally, where the RNP may be one, but it's going to narrow to a 0.3. Here, vertically, um, the RNP is going to narrow as well in terms of feet. So some of the things on IN approaches, uh, it is a, uh, they, they did this primarily to be standardized on non-precision approaches. So in other words, one procedure fits all. So whether you're doing a VOR approach or an NDB approach or a RNAV a GPS approach, it's, it's one procedure. It is a non-precision approach uh, with no auto land capability. So you have to manually land. The big advantage of this is the alerting is similar to an ILS approach. So if you get off the glide path, you're going to get alerted to the fact that you're getting off the glide path. You'll get the uh, GPWS glide slope, glide slope, glide slope. It won't say glide path, but it'll say glide slope, indicating you're getting off the glide path. Uh, IAN approaches have to be selected from the database. You can't build anything with an IAN approach. You can't modify it. Uh, from the final approach fix inbound. Uh, it has to be uh, exactly as it is from the database from the FAFN. It's a QNH only approach. Uh, QFE is not allowed. Uh, you must have a published glide path angle shown on the legs page. Um, normally that's going to be um, three degrees but could be different depending on the approach. Um, all engines or engine and operative approaches are authorized and the RMP has to be appropriate for the approach that must be used. So again, if you're doing an RNA GPS like we are today, we'd have to have 0.3. Uh, but again, on the Dash 8, it can go down as low as 0.1, but I'm not sure it's there yet. Uh, raw data monitoring of the localizer is required for all localizer-based approaches. Well, we're going to have that on the PFD. You'll have the localizer displayed. Uh, FMC-based non-ILS approaches, uh, raw data monitoring is recommended. In section uh, C73 of the operations specifications, uh, we'll list what type of operator you are as authorized by the FAA. And in some cases, we don't have to add MDA plus 50 feet. Uh, we can uh, set the MDA and uh, that little bit of uh, altitude that you will lose during the go-around is acceptable and approved. Uh, if you're not an authorized operator, then you have to add MD plus 50, and that accounts for losing some altitude um, from a missed approach where you will not violate the MDA. In the other case, you're treating the MDA like a DA, and that's the same that you can lose a little bit of altitude during the missed approach. Whether it's uh, you're setting the MDA or DA depends on what type of approach that you're doing. Now the order of preference now for non-precision approaches then in the Dash 8 would be the IAN would be the highest level. Uh, next would be VNAV and third would be vertical speed. So uh, normally we're going to use IAN as long as IAN is working and acceptable. On the IAN approach, the approach push button is used to uh, arm the uh, either localizer or the LNAV guidance and also to then arm the uh, glide slow approach push button is also used to uh, arm the glide path. Uh, the glide slope can be disabled like we talked about uh, last week on the approach reference page uh, or when you select the approach on the arrivals page. Uh, the glide slope can be disabled at that time so that you can get the glide path. Basically that's what you're telling the computer is to inhibit the glide slope so that you can uh, make use of the glide, the FMC generated glide path on an IEN approach. These are some of the possible combinations you'll have as far as FMAs go. If it's an FMC uh, non-localizer based approach, this would be like a VOR approach. Uh, you would have speed uh, for auto throttle, uh, FAC for the lateral mode, which would be final approach course, 
and GP for a glide path. So that would be a case like a VOR approach or an NDB approach. A localizer based approach, uh, you would have speed, localizer, and glide path. And a back course approach, you would have speed, back course, and glide path. In the case of uh, having a localizer based uh, ILS approach, you'll have both ILS and FMC as the source because the localizer is coming from the ILS, but the glide path is coming from the FMC as far as the source goes. In the case of the VOR and ADF approach, it's all FMC based, so it would say FMC for the source. Uh, generally, the deviation scale.